I have never used the airbrush this much. Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel. It is a brand new month and I have never been this excited to get back into making tutorials. Now, first things first, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. I'm a realist. That's a lie, let's be honest. I'm an optimist to a point of being a little delusional. Wait, what? But first things first, it is starting to get a little cold outside and that obviously means I'm going to start wearing jumpers because I have missed having sleeves. Um, it is nowhere near winter temperature, but you know, I, I just want to. Anyway, this is a topic that I always circle back to because every time I try to learn something new, I find that there's a lot more to discover. So today, once again, we're gonna take a look at painting skin but in a very specific way we're gonna take a look at painting super soft really blended out very clay like moldy beautiful skin without it looking like an over blended mess this video is highly inspired by the work of Warren Lowe, whose page I will link up here. Um, go check him out, he is amazing. But he has this way of painting skin that is super blended with no hard edges, but it still doesn't look like a flat, muddy mess. And looking back, Julia Razumova, Blue Satan, if you know her like that, um, also paints skin in a very similar way, where you have no visible hard edges and it's all very softly blended, but at the same time it has dimension and doesn't look completely flat. I've managed to break this down into four steps or rather four concepts because you don't necessarily have to do them in this order but I feel like with looking at the end result um, it is definitely several steps up from how I have been painting skin for so long. If you guys want to paint along we will be working with some basic spheres with every single step so feel free to have your painting software open and join in the process um as always i super appreciate likes and comments make sure you subscribe for more tutorials in the future and if you guys would like to come say hi make sure you check out my instagram and discord all of the links are always in the video description but now without much further ado let's take a look at painting smooth skin without over blending Alrighty, so I want to start this video by sharing with you guys a quick overview of how I paint skin in general. I started by creating two flat circles coloured with a pretty average mid-tone skin colour. First, I like to decide the lighting setup in grayscale. Since this is just a sphere, it's super easy. We're going to go with a standard top left light. So the shadow is at the bottom right of the sphere. I'm going to go for a cool shadow and a warm highlight and mid-tone. Now, here is how I normally paint skin. I start with a flat shadow tone and I like to use a chalk brush to begin. I'll then put a warm mid-tone in there using the same brush. As you can tell, there are loads of hard edges. We're going to soften them out selectively. But first, we're going to place our overall highlight tone where the light would hit directly. I then make contrast adjustments. Like here, for instance, the sphere looked too low contrast and boring. So I went in with a more saturated shadow tone as well as a more saturated highlight just to make it dynamic. And once I'm happy with the overall contrast, I then grab a blender and start to blend specific areas. So I'll start by blending within the highlight because I find that the light in there is so bright you don't see much texture in there. So it's going to look rather smooth. I then blend within the shadow for the same but opposite reason. Here the light barely hits and the dark causes there to be little to no visible texture. The mid-tone is where I like to focus most of my texture because a the light isn't too bright or dark just enough to see the texture and b the mid-tone is usually where the form is starting to shift and mold around the bone structure 
So you also get some form shadows in there, like on the cheekbone or the bridge of the nose. And then I'll add in some subsurface scattering with an airbrush setter overlay and add in a cool tone specular highlight to really contrast the warm tones around it. And that is a basic overview of how I usually paint skin. Now here is me applying a similar technique, except I'm going to do it with an airbrush. So I've started with the shadow and then put in the mid-tone and then the highlight. In my head, this is how I would assume painting skin with an airbrush would go. Same colors and order of painting, but switching out the chalk brush for an airbrush. And then for extra smoothness, I would go in and blend all of the hard edges. And the result is a muddy mess. It is semi passable on a sphere because it is very hard to mess up a sphere with a round airbrush. But doing this on a face would leave you with something akin to Lady Cassandra. In fact, look what happens when I draw a fairly flat curve on both spheres. It looks odd on the first one because the line doesn't seem to wrap around the more rounded form of the sphere, but on the second one, that flat curve looks like a perfect fit because the sphere itself looks super flat. The reason I'm taking the time to explain this to you is because I want you to understand that this may be why our airbrush skin looks so flat. It's because we're simply switching up our painting implement but not our technique. But as we've seen time and time again, just having a different brush doesn't make up for your painting technique. If that were the case, I would be Emma Little Dury by now. Ah, the dream persists regardless. Anyway, so when it comes to painting beautiful skin that is super smooth but still has good form and lighting, I've learned that there are four things we need to consider. So let's take a look at them. The very first thing I noticed is that while everything is super blended, the hardness of an edge is shown by the width of a gradient. So say I have a grayscale gradient. If it is super widely spread, it looks like a soft, not very dramatic curve. But if I really squash the gradients close together, now it looks almost like a fold, like the curve is super dramatic. So say we make a third sphere and still paint it using an airbrush, I'm going to place the same colors as before, but this time I'm going to pay attention to how wide the gradients are between neighboring colors. I want the vast majority of the curvature to be where my mid-tone turns into shadow because that is where the form of the sphere is starting to curve away from the light. So thinking back to the grayscale gradient from before, I want to keep the narrow Narrowest gradients where I want the strongest curves and vice versa. The way I'm gonna achieve this narrow gradient is by essentially pushing the mid-tone and shadow tone closer together and have a thin strip of blending in between. By contrast, I want the highlight to mid-tone transition to be a lot flatter, like a very gentle color fall off. So here I'm gonna place the highlight and mid-tone further apart and have loads of space for the in-between values as we slowly transition from one color to the next. So if I overlay some curves to show you the width of each transition between values, you'll see that there is a very narrow transition on either side of the shadow because I want both the mid-tone and the bounce light to be at a dramatic curve. However, the highlight to mid-tone transition is wider, which means that is a flatter curve. Say now I brought the mid-tone closer to the highlight area and made a narrower transition area there. Do you see how it now looks weird and makes the mid-tone look flat, almost like it has a bend at the top and a bend at the bottom and is flat in between? So knowing where to place a wide gradient and where to place a narrow one is super important. Let's now think of the anatomy of the face. Here is a random head I've drawn and I've started by placing in the hue shifts but keeping it all shadowy. Bear in mind I am using a round airbrush, one that came built into Critter I think. So let's think of the anatomy of the face. We know that the forehead is going to be rather flat but curves sharply at the brow bone so that is a narrow gradient. 
With the nose, the bulb tends to be rounded and turns sharply into the nostrils. That's another narrow gradient. The cheeks, now there is a wide gradient because the cheeks curve very softly down to the jaw. So we're going to have a gradual transition from the highest point in the apples of the cheek down into the shadow of the jaw. The jaw is in shadow because I've chosen an overhead light source here. At the tops of the cheeks though, they go into the eye socket, but that is a pretty sharp bend. So we're definitely placing a narrow transition there. So thinking about the anatomy of the head, you can start to take an educated guess at where your transitions will be wide and soft and where they need to be sharp and narrow. Next, we're going to make the skin more dynamic by using contrast to further enhance the sharpness or flatness of form. So coming back to the sphere, I want to make the shadow more dramatic. So I'm going to go ahead and darken it a lot more. Still using the airbrush, I'm keeping in mind the width of the gradient still. In fact, let's see what happens if I keep the contrast lower on one half of the sphere and really push the darkness of the shadow on the other half. Half. Do you see how the low contrast area looks flatter while the high contrast area looks a lot bendier? One isn't better than the other, it is just all about knowing where to use low contrast and where to use higher contrast, depending on which areas are meant to be flat and which ones are meant to have a dramatic curve. I went ahead and brightened the highlight, and then even after blending the accidental hard edges, you'll see that the higher contrast sphere looks a lot rounder than the flatter low contrast pancake next to it. Coming back to the head, we're going to look at the areas where we want higher contrast. The cheekbones is an excellent place to throw in a darker shadow. It really gives us a sense of the skin kind of folding over that zygomatic arch. Another great high contrast area is the shadow of the eye socket, where the skin of the eyebrow folds dramatically in. But the curve as it then bulges out over the outside of the brow bone is smoother, so we can keep that lower contrast. However, some people do have deeper set eyes and you can always up the contrast in that transition to emulate that look. The top of the chin under the lower lip is also a great high contrast place because not only do you have skull geometry there, you also have a drop shadow from the lip. So just like we did with the gradient widths, it is important to go around the anatomy and think of which transitions are dramatic enough to really push the contrast for. It seems like a lot of conscious thought, like sometimes I just want to switch off mentally and render, but I promise you, just like with any skill, this gets easier the longer you practice. Just going through the motions for this one painting, I noticed my mind adapting to this technique as we went on. Anyway, yeah, I went in and played around with the contrast all over the face. It looks a little messy now though, so let's go ahead and clean this up. Okay, let's talk some more about contrast, but in a slightly different sense. It's all well and good to have soft blending, but to really make it stand out as soft, you want to have areas that are not so soft. It's like neon pink doesn't look like neon pink unless it is surrounded by dull tones, right? So on this sphere, for instance, I've gone in and added a super sharp edge. Basically just two values right next to each other with no gradient or blending in between. See how not only does it add an interesting detail in there, it also contrasts the rest of the soft blending so that the softness of the airbrushed areas is enhanced. However, we can't have sharp edges within the skin or it will defeat the purpose of the softness. So instead, we're going to be strategic about the placement of the sharp edges. We're only going to add sharpness where the facial features are. So we're going to go in with a harder brush. I'm still using that chalk brush I got as a meds map bonus, link to the courses in the description, still loving that brush. But I'm basically just going in and rendering the eyes, brows, mouth and the bulb of the nose as I normally would. 
Not only does this step add some much needed definition that makes the face look like a face, it has the added bonus of making the soft areas look even softer. Bear in mind though, we don't want to paint too many hard edges too far into all that soft blending, so keep it as close to the facial features as possible. I also went ahead and hardened up the shadows just underneath the cheekbones, just because your girl loves a super sharp cheekbone, probably because I don't have those. Hashtag Moonface Gang, right? But yeah, I tried not to take the hard edges too far out of the shadowy areas though. We want the softness to be enhanced, not painted over. I did end up having to resize and liquefy the face just to get the proportions right and do a bunch of color adjustments and detail work, but let's take a look at the fourth and final detail to nailing the style. Now, this is one of the sneaky ones that might bamboozle you, because I know it bamboozled me. Looking closer at the work of Warren Lu, I noticed that the skin is smooth, but actually has a lot of texture, which initially led me to think maybe it is just painted with a texture brush and blended out, but if that were the case, we would see some brush strokes, which we don't. That led me to believe that the texture is applied later over the top of all this blending, and in very specific areas. So to test this out, I created a new pattern fill layer and picked a very basic sandpaper-like pattern, just a basic noisy texture. I set the layer to soft light and lowered the opacity, masked it all out with black, and then painted some of the texture back into the mask selectively using an airbrush and white. I found that he sticks most of his texture on the highest points of the face. So on the portrait, I went ahead and did just that, placing the texture on the apples of the cheek, the nose bulb, a little bit on the brow bone, and a little bit on the forehead. Since the layer is set to fairly transparent soft light, this is going to be a subtle texture. However, in my opinion, this is probably a step that makes the skin actually feel like skin. Real skin is never super airbrushed or smooth, don't let the filters fool you. Skin has texture and pores, and although we're not painting scars and pigmentation here, adding that little noisy texture is a great way to inject a lot of realism into the painting very easily. And with that, we now have super soft, super smooth skin that still looks fairly realistic. Do you feel leveled up? I know I do. Gonna be honest, at first this did kind of feel like a little more effort to paint skin, um, but as time went by I found that it's actually really fun to paint very abstract skin and then add some very sharp details as opposed to doing it the opposite way like I usually do. What do you guys think? Do you prefer to paint like this, where you start abstract and then add in the defined details later? Or do you prefer working the other way around, starting with super hard edges and then blending out selectively? Let me know in the comments below, because I'm really curious to hear about your workflow. Of course, if you enjoyed this video and learned something today, please remember to like and subscribe if you feel like doing so. And if you want to come say hi, you can always check out my Instagram and Discord. All of the links are in the video description below. Also, I'll leave all of my other skin related videos up here in the outro. Feel free to marathon these if you feel like it. But that's about all I have to say today. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Check out some more videos up here and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!